Chris, the Six Nations has kicked off three games. Let's start where it started, and that's Wales against Ireland. And look, we, we're looking at Ireland, aren't we? And we're constantly asking the questions, you know, is this team going to be able to produce this kind of form come the end of the year at the World Cup? Uh, this was an impressive performance from them. Would you agree that it was the best performance out of anyone, any team in the Six Nations opening round? Yes, it was. And, and what they've carried on with is this, is this style of rugby, which you see from Leinster as well, which is, you know, either do, they do one off or miss one and then they'll do around the back. And, and it keeps the, the defence guessing. And in, in Wales's case, they were still guessing when the final whistle had gone. Uh, it wasn't impressive for, for Gatlin. He's got the dad's army of a team and he's playing against an Irish team that knows exactly what it's doing. Technically, they're very, very good. And they even sort of were able to operate at that level with, with their old, old man at, at Scrum Off because uh, Gibson uh, Park managed to injure himself in the in the warm-up. And he is now out uh, of the French game as well, along with Tag Furlong and Kian Healy. So there's three uh, key players who won't be playing for Ireland. Now, in the past, you would have said, well, they've got real problems now. They've lost three key players. Not this squad. This squad has got real depth. And that probably sets them apart. Probably only France could probably come close to them in terms of being able to bring in somebody who's equally as strong. And you, know, you add that to a really, really well-oiled coaching team led by Andy Farrell. And they deserve to be a, a favourite you know, going to win the Six Nations because they've got the French coming this weekend in Dublin for an absolutely titanic match. Yeah, I mean, this is only the only frustrating thing about it. there's never any final, is there? And you know, you, you always look at the Six Nations and you think, what, what wouldn't it be better if that match was the last round? But I suppose they just do the draw, and that's how it is. Ireland versus France, it effectively is, is the final. Wales under Gatland first up, so no great improvement. No, uh, not very good at all uh, because the attack is still stuttering. They've got a new attack coach in, Alex King, who's basically worked with them for about a week and a half. And you couldn't actually see anything in terms of what they were trying to bring to the uh, to the table that was anything different from the autumn. And, you know, they had pressure t- They had pressure times in the second half. They really had the Irish backpedaling at, at a couple of points, but they just weren't good enough to score the points. And that clinical edge is something that he might put in place by the time he gets to the World Cup. But for this Six Nations, I think for Gatlin, there's the case of when do I tell the old fellas you really are over the hill and I'm going to bring in some young guys because he's got that real dichotomy, isn't he? Does he get rid of all the old guys and really suffer in the Six Nations or try and hold the line and try and eke out a couple of wins and then start feeding them in slowly in the warm-up matches? It's a real problem for Gatland, and uh, I, he, he would have known this going into the Six Nations, but I think he would have expected much more of a bounce from him coming back than he actually got. Also, when we're looking at these matches, obviously, you know, down here, you know, we've got eagle eye on this because, you know, you only get so few opportunities to see the, you know, the big teams play before the World Cup. You know, what can we, what can we take from any of these results from this competition in terms of going to France in September or October? Well, you can take that the, the French uh, are going to be uh, only slight favourites for the tournament because they're hosts. The way Italy went at them means that suddenly Italy going into the World Cup, if they can possibly you know, get another win against Wales and maybe, maybe even sneak one against England this Sunday, you know, they're dangerous. Kieran Crowley's got them playing in a really attractive way. OK, it is a bit helter-skelter and they insist... <laughs> on running out of their own 22 at every opportunity, which, of course, you know, causes problems. And they handed a couple of very easy scores to the French. But, boy, did they come back in that second half. Normally, you get to 16 minutes and you wave goodbye to the Italians as most of them head to the dressing room and you know, the, the opposition takes over. Not this team. Kieran's gone playing really, really well. And I'm really impressed with them. And, you know, England were, were stuttering against Scotland, uh, missed some key tackles. And if they do that against the Italians, the Italians will, will, will lap it up because they've got some outstanding runners in their back line. All right, Wales versus Ireland, Italy versus France, England versus Scotland. I just want to go back to this Ireland performance and, and just you know keep thinking about 
the the series in New Zealand beating us here is that is that akin to what Clive Woodward's England did in 2003 when they came down here and beat us and beat Australia and he always said afterwards that was actually the key is this island side now got the belief to go on that's that's the question is it because they haven't got past a quarter final at a World Cup but they're doing absolutely everything right they're impressive they're winning these games as they should it's just we've still have those questions about can you convert that at a world tournament yeah, you're absolutely right. They've been dreadful at World Cups. But you're also absolutely correct in, in drawing comparisons with 2003 and the England wins in New Zealand and Australia. That just convinced England that they were, they really were the best team uh, in the world. And you could argue that when it got to the World Cup and the World Cup final, they were probably just over the top of that hill and were starting to slide down the other side. But they had enough confidence and momentum to hold on to their self-belief, and it got them through in, in that final and extra time. Ireland, it's been a massive boost to beat you guys in that series. They've come back, and they've just dragged everybody together in this collective belief now that we really are the best team in the world. Because before, they used to be appalling at handling pressure. They just fell apart when they were expected to win. Now, they don't mind it. And that, you know, that, that mindset change is vital. It's something that the All Blacks used to have. You guys are trying to rediscover it. The Springboks have it, but I think they spend most of their time trying to convince themselves they really are still the world number one team because the rankings, which you can argue about whether they are really relevant, particularly when a World Cup draw is done about 20 years before the tournament starts. But the number one team in the world at the moment is Ireland. And you know what? They're actually handling that and they're feeling good in the skin. Chris Jones, Time Times Online, RugbyPass.com. We're talking about the Six Nations, second game up, and I watched the end of this game, Scotland versus England, and a South African winger just playing absolutely out of his brain. Uh, Van der Merve, it was his tries ultimately that were the difference. But w- w- isn't this a game that England should win, even though Scotland have got up over them three times in a row, four and five? Well, again, you talk, you come back to this thing about the bounce of a new guy in charge, and we expected... Borthwick's team would at least be really effective in the things they were trying to do. And actually, what let them down were one of the key aspects of any team he coaches, which is your kick chase. And they put in a couple of dreadful kicks with poor chases, the last of which led to that second Duan van der Merwe try. And it was a Ben Young's kick was far too long and no one could get up there to to pressure the Scots. And you've got to ask yourself, you know, 120-odd caps, Ben Young's, should he go to the World Cup on, on this current form no so you take him out jack van portfleet's a young scrum half the next the next best scrum half is rafi kirk of sale he hasn't really got back into planes from injury recently so young's may just hang in there just because he's fit and he's got that experience but england were you know at times were absolutely dreadful in the one thing that they're meant to be really good at which is defending Kevin Sinfield, he must have been banging his head on the desk and watching from the box because they made some critical errors. And if the Italians, when they look at that, will, will be thinking that this is an England team which is porous. You can actually run rings around them. That was never the case. Even with Eddie's lot, you had you had some kind of defensive pattern. I know they're trying to bring a new system, but quality, quality Marty, at international level, to be missing the tackles they did, Five people waved bye bye to Duran van der Merwe for that first try. Five international great try, players though, failed great to make the tackle. Mm. It was a great tackle, but the first tackle should be made by Marchand. He missed him on halfway. And this is just like, yeah, well, fine. Don Brandt had a chance to go low on him, gets handed off with the final chance to tackle him. And it was a brilliant try to watch, but it was almost like slow motion death for the English defence. All right, we go to Italy, France then, and the French 15 minutes to go were down in this game. Um, they did win it. Is that just one of those kind of games, blowing the cobwebs out early? I mean, what else can we read into it? Yeah, it was a very, very strange performance from the French, and I know that you know, Sean Edwards is absolutely livid with them. He's, his team conceded 18 penalties. He's No team he's ever had been defence coach of has conceded 18 penalties. So you can imagine what this week's training session is going to be like with him. He will be absolutely cracking that whip because he takes it personally and the players will feel it. And you, know, you can tell it was a very strange performance by France because Gregory Aldrit, who's been absolutely central to what everything they do at number eight, was taken off after 60 minutes. And in fact, they were totally reliant on their own version of a, whatever a French bomb squad is 
uh, who came on, their replacements came on and got them over the line. Jalabert came on, replaced Entomac, and there was a big discussion about whether Jalabert should be in a team in the first place. Well, the way he scored that try and the way he sort of gave them some life at the end there and saved their Six Nations campaign, because in World Cup year, for them to have lost the opening game, you can imagine what the, that they would go into meltdown. They've held, they've held on just enough against a very impressive Italian team. They've now got Sean Edwards, who's going to put them through the mill in training. But, and it's a big but, they have to go to Dublin. They've been talking all throughout the build-up to this uh, tournament, Marty, that the one game they're really concerned about is, is, going to, is going to Dublin because of what Ireland have done to New Zealand, both there and away, and the fact that they are the best team in the, in the world at the moment. And if the French do fail to win in Dublin, which is a very strong possibility, then yeah, they, will ha- they will face for the first time yeah, 14 games in a row they've won, they will suddenly have that big question mark over them. Are you really good enough to win a World Cup? And we've seen it before with French teams. They start looking navel-gazing and start questioning themselves when really they don't have an awful lot wrong with their team. It's just they had a bad day. Yeah, Chris, I mean, this is the other thing. I mean, Ireland and France, I mean, we're looking at these two teams. Are they the two best teams in the world? Or or, or, or realistically, can either of them be upset on a one-off basis by the two top teams in the Southern Hemisphere, us uh, and and, and uh, South Africa? I mean, look, it is a World Cup. It is a one-off thing. That's the thing. Look, these tournament round robins, normally the cream does float to the top, doesn't it? The most consistent team wins. But that's not a World Cup. No, it's not. A, and the, the, the great... The great, uh, if you like, the great straw that the French can hold on to going to Dublin is that, is that Leinster, the outstanding team in Europe, were beaten in the European Cup final by La Rochelle with Ronan Agara as their head coach. But what they, they beat them by absolutely hammering them up front and not giving them the platform that they need to play this really fast moving uh, attacking game. And the French will have to adopt that type of attitude in Dublin. They're going to have to go there and basically beat up Ireland up front. They're going to have to be incredibly uh, physical and dominate them because that's the only way you can stop this Ireland team overrunning you. And it's what South Africa will be holding on to in their belief they can, they can defend a title is that they know how, they have a pack that could beat up the Irish pack. And it sounds uncertain. It sounds like you're going back to the 70s. But it comes down to that, because if you allow the uh, Irish the speed of ball that their their game is built around, you're in real trouble. And so the French have to, and they don't actually have a a, a fearsome pack. They've got a good pack, but they need people like Willemse to be hammering around, doing a sort of Estebet type of job, upsetting and annoying and basically putting the fear of God into the Irish forwards. All right, then, in conclusion, so what do we learn from round number one? Ireland are a great team. France, we've still got question marks about, and England, well, they are going to go to the World Cup, but they're not going to win it. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, but you're spot on there. I think the, the, the added interest for this weekend is that because of those results, Scotland have leapt to their joint ever highest position of fifth in the world. They've leapfrogged England, and they've also now above Australia, who for some reason, probably just because Eddie's taken over, dropped one place in the world rankings uh, without even playing. So it's, it's really as stacked against Eddie.